Okay, um, welcome everyone to the second day of learning labs in this year's virtual ANH Academy. My name is Heike Walker. I am a research assistant in the Humana program at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I will be the technical manager for the session on assessing, assessing food environments for healthy diets led by Inge Drauer from Wageningen University. Thank you for taking part in the ANH Academy week. We hope you will join us for other sessions to come. A quick reminder, you can find all conference materials and the program on our, our ANH Academy website at uh, anh-academy.org slash 2020. Before I hand over to Inge Bauer, I have a few technical announcements to ensure our experience is as smooth and interactive as possible. This session will be recorded and posted on the ANH Academy website after the conference. All participants are currently muted, but please introduce yourselves using the chat function. Tell us your name, where you're joining us from, and the organization you're working with. For those of you unfamiliar with Zoom, you can access the chat box by clicking the chat button at the bottom of the Zoom window. Lastly, um, if at any point you experience technical issues, please check your audio settings and your internet connection. You can re reconnect to the session using the same Zoom link. If you have a technical question, please send me a private message using the chat box. Thank you very much again for joining and I will now hand over to Inge Bauer. Thank you very much, uh, Heike. Um, welcome to all of you and um, thank you for joining us um, in this learning lab on assessing food environments for healthy diets. And while you are entering your names, and it's good to see so many names from all parts of the world, your name and your affiliation in the chat box, um, I would also like to introduce our presenters for uh, today's session. Um, uh, my name is um, Inge Brouwer. I'm um, Associate Professor in Global Nutrition at Wageningen University. Um, there's Anna Herford. She's an independent researcher, and most of you will know her as co-leader of the act 2 Nut community. Uh, of practice and she's senior research associate of um, Harvard School of Public Health. Um, then we have Selima, Selina Ahmed and um, she's associate professor of sustainable food systems at Montana State University. Then we have Shona Downs, um, assistant professor at the Rutgers School of Public Health. Um, then we have Celine Termot, uh, she's regional lead for Africa uh, for food environment and consumer behavior. And she's working with the Alliance of Biodiversity International and uh, CIAT. And then we have Elise Talsma. She's assistant professor at Global Nutrition of Wageningen University. And then we have Gina Kennedy, and she's director of food systems uh, of the USAID, uh, USAID um, Advancing uh, Nutrition. So we have a wonderful program lined up for you uh, with short presentations, polls and exercises. And um, of course, we depend on and we ask for your active participation in this learning lab um, um, and to make a learning lab um, as a success. So I would like to explain which platforms um, we are using. Um, and please listen carefully because it might be a bit uh, difficult. We are using two different platforms. So the first one um, we want to use is slido.com. So we would like to ask you um, to leave your full screen and go to your web browser and open slido.com um, either by phone um, or your tablet or your computer and use password uh, hashtag uh, T161 and when you enter slido you will see two tabs um, on top um, uh, one is called uh, poll and one is called question and answer so the poll we are using um, uh, to have some teaser questions uh, during the session, especially in the beginning. And the question and answer you can use to ask your questions. So we will follow this. Um, you can ask your question, uh, but you can also vote for another question. If you think somebody else is entering a question you find very interesting or you really would like to know the answer, then you can vote for this question and it's getting a higher priority on the list, so a larger chance to, uh, to be um, uh, answered uh, by one of us. Um, a second um, uh, um, platform we are using during the session is SurveyMonkey, and we will share the link later um, when we are at the point we will use SurveyMonkey. So use a separate tab in your browser to open a SurveyMonkey with the link. 
Yeah, so please don't use the chat uh, version of Zoom um, because we, pre uh, we would like, we prefer to use slido.com um, and we uh, will start with a poll later on and then we will use a question and answer. Um, I, hope, um, I hope this is clear and we will keep on repeating it and lead you through it. Um, all will be muted um, unless you are asked um, to speak um, uh, by one of us. So the um, uh, topic of this um, session is assessing a food environment. And food environments represent actually the range of food that can be accessed um, in the context where people live. So food choices result uh, from the interaction of the food environment and the consumer influenced by a lot of individual characteristics. Yeah, and shaping these food environments um, uh, to enable healthy choices can have a large impact, a positive impact on diet quality and nutrition. But um, there are still major knowledge gaps in how we can assess uh, food environments. And that's where this session um, is about. So in this session, we aim that you um, at the end of the session, we'll have a better understanding of different dimensions of a food environment um, that you have obtained um, a guide, um, a guided insight in some of the tools uh, that are available and that you have experimented with uh, one of the tools. And we uploaded some pre-session materials um, and hope uh, you found time uh, to, to look at them. So readings, there were also uh, two interesting uh, videos um, that you could look at. Um, and uh, this slide is showing you the program uh, that we have lined up uh, for you. Um, so we will have a question and answer session uh, using Slido on preparatory material. Um, we have a session on photos uh, to be used to discuss food environment. We have three short presentations on some tools to assess food environment. And then we go into the exercise uh, using the COVID-19 food environment tool. And we will end the session uh, uh, with a summary and with a question and answer. So please let us go now uh, to the first part, uh, which is the question and answer session on preparatory uh, material. And I would like to give uh, the word to um, Elise um, to explain um, uh, some of these questions that will be asked. So open your slido.com, um, um, use the hashtag um, and go to question and answer tab. Uh, yeah, the poll tab, sure, sorry, the poll tab. Um, and the first question is actually already um, appearing. So the floor is yours, um, Elise. Yeah, thank you very much, Inge. Um, so please go to slido.com and uh, answer the question for us. So the question is actually, what are the four different aspects of the personal food environment? And then Inge, you can share your screen with the results. So would you like me to do that also possible? No, um, I'm busy showing it. Okay. It's here. I hope everybody voted by now. We have 31 votes, so come on, people. Not yet everybody is there. Some more are coming. I hope everybody could get access to slido.com. If not, could you please mention that in the chat box, then we will try to look for a solution. Forty two people. So it's going well. We have fifty four yeah. participants at the moment. Yeah, but some of us are in the in, in, are presenting, so maybe they will not do it. I think that now uh well if nobody is answering anymore. Inge, will you tell the right answer? No, I think you should do. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, it's very good. I think you all watched the video because it's indeed convenience, desirability, affordability, and accessibility. 
Very good. Um, having said that, let's go to the next question. Okay. Can you reorder the following terms for the socio-ecological model, starting from the diets in the inner circle? If you watch the video, you know what we're talking about. And then you can specify what the right order is. And it goes pretty quick. The first people are already voting. But it's a bit of a, yeah, the question is maybe a little bit more difficult. So nobody will see what you voted, so just go for it. And don't be disappointed if you have the wrong answer, because the video or the link with the video will stay on the website, so you can have another look. Very true. Yeah, but uh, I can already say that most of you are doing it right because it's indeed the first one. Yeah. Very good. So it starts with the individual factors, then you have the food environment, then the sectors of influence, uh, the social cultural part and the ecosystems. Okay, let's go to the next question. This is more on the typologies. Can you mention the four types of food environment in order they appear in the food environment transition? So it's an open question. Wow, this is really a good class. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. these were indeed the, uh, the answers we were looking for. Five people said you have all of them there. And you all agree on that it starts with the wild. Um, then comes the cultivated, indeed. But then, is it then informal or is it formal? I see both in the answers. Yeah. But indeed, it is first informal and then formal. Okay. Very good. So, even before everybody has answered, let's go to the next question. What is your main food environment? So this is for us to be very curious about how it is with you. I see a big formal. It's nice to see all these results saying, eh? <laughs> really nice. Yeah, I see so you there's smiling. There's really a variety of different um, and food environments. Yeah. You see that formal is the biggest one. Yeah. Formal and environment. Okay, good. Well, those were the four questions that we had for you to think a little bit about the presentations that were given as material uh, for this learning lab. Um, but yeah, maybe you also have questions that you want to ask based on the videos that you saw. So um, here in Slido, 
you can also now put your questions. And then um, we will try to answer them. Yeah, so please keep logged in into Slido and go to the question and answer tab and uh, write your questions. And we will come back to them um, later in the session. Um, because now I would like to continue with the next part, um, which is Gina Kennedy, um, who will tell more about um, how to use photos to characterize um, the food environment. So Gina, the floor is yours. Great, thanks Inga. Are you gonna be advancing the slides? Um, yes, I, yeah. Okay, because it's still showing on my screen the Slido. Is it? Slido.com. Mm -hmm. So uh, while we're waiting for the share screen to uh, start, just welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, maybe even good evening for some of you. Thank you so much for joining this learning lab. And um, my name is Gina Kennedy, and I'm a director for food systems with a USAID funded project called Advancing Nutrition. So I'm gonna talk a little bit um, about how to use photographs to document the food environment, uh, different dimensions. If you are able to watch Anna's uh, presentation, she did that really beautiful. So the objectives of using this photo documentation are really to take intentional and focused photographs of the food environment, knowing exactly what food environment characteristic you want to photo. You can uh, look at single or multiple locations where you live. You can also compare urban, peri-urban, rural settings. You could also look even at different countries and see how food environment, um, according to photos, is changing uh, or co contrasting in, in different um, countries. And so this is a really quick presentation and, and we you feel free to talk to me later or, or more, but the basic steps here, and it's also on timing, so I'm going a little quickly, um, are to discuss in advance with your team who's going to be taking the photos, the exact food environment dimensions you wanna capture. So it's a super flexible tool. You can include or exclude the different dimensions that you need for your research. Make sure your team understands the definition of each of these dimensions. And then when you get to the market and field, it's really important that you're respectful and obtain consent to get these photographs. Uh, ethical clearance sometimes is required, particularly if you're really trying to photo people. Uh, there's quite a lot of regulations. And then after the field work, make sure that you download the photos, tag them, and describe the situation. So describe if you're looking at availability or access or um, thanks, Inga. I don't know how it works if you go backwards. You don't have to do that. Can you go forward? Yep. Another yeah. one? No. So um, these are the characteristics that we'll see in this photo collage. It's a, it's a really beautiful photo montage and it was developed by you because you put in your uh, photos and we really appreciate it. I'm going to really stop talking after the first couple slides uh, start advancing. They're on a five second timer. So you'll just get a very rich um, impression of how you can use photos in many different contexts to document these different food environment dimensions. After, if you have questions, please go to Slido Q&A and type your questions in there. And otherwise, just um, enjoy, enjoy the photos that you shared with us. So please don't hesitate to ask your questions in slido.com under question and answers. So yeah, this one is looking at the wild and cultivated environment a bit. Um, some of those nice, some people submitted really nice photos about, about wild and cultivated environments as well, which is interesting. So it got stuck, Inga. 
Maybe you're going to have to advance. So now this is the dimension of access, which is, um, it's, it's a little bit um, tied into the type of food environment. So for example, this is an informal type of store kiosk in Kenya. I think, uh, I don't know if we have, are on the timing, Inga, or you're advancing? No, I'm in this? something. Okay. Type of supermarket. These are sidewalk vendors um, in terms of people having access to fresh fruits. You can just grab these, or buy them right from the sidewalk. Cars stop by. Uh, this was a photo of um, a different type of access. So people on their bicycles going to, um, going to meet producers. Uh, this is a woman, and some of the slides are very interesting in time of COVID. You see them all wearing their masks. And she's selling her um, leafy vegetables right from her farm gate. Huh. Uh, this was a Facebook page that somebody submitted. And um, you don't have to worry about having to read everything like really quickly because uh, you'll have these slides available to you. So you can go back at your leisure because some of them are dense with text. There was some people put lots of explanations. Um, affordability and price. It's really more the price aspect, but some people spent a lot of time explaining why they sh think that this photo demonstrates affordability, like these foods are locally grown in Kenya and they're more affordable. Uh, certain of them are more expensive. Same concept for Nepal. And then these are the actual prices. So a lot of you are quite familiar, maybe you even listened to Anna when she talked about collecting price data. So these kind of just are some photos that show you the different prices in different markets, um, maybe for different items. Anna talked in her um, lecture about relative price, for example. These are some prices for a kilo of uh, these different vegetables in a market in Rome. You can see the diversity also. This again is another interesting COVID photo. So you see the people lining up and uh, there's a long description, but basically the um, producers are coming um, to sell their produce at like a wholesale price because uh, the markets aren't functioning very well in that case. These are now um, some quality and safety issues. So this photo is demonstrating something that's really quite unsafe. Um, a food product is being stored in a fertilizer bag as just, um, as just a storing storage vehicle for food. Next. And these are, um, you know, in some situations, uh, the markets aren't all elevated on stilts or um, off the ground. So this could pose problems for animals and contamination, maybe with dust. And this is if you have your refuse too close, you could have problems with rats or flies or other um, food safety issues. Are you advancing here or is it still moving on its own? No, I'm advancing. Oh, okay. Yeah, these are some, um, when you get like lower into some different characteristics such as convenience and time saving, it was harder to find uh, photos or not that many people submitted. This is a photo from Ethiopia where um, they have pre-prepared mixes of pulses and spices. This is also a pre-prepared and, and we see actually a food label on this, which is not so common in the informal type of market. Next. Uh, so um, this one was the same. Um, Oops, that one, that's, that one was somebody who had a, a garden for convenience. That was mentioned also by Anna. And then this is promotion and advertising. We see um, Noor uh, being advertised in Ethiopia. Next. And Indomie, I think uh, this is a worldwide phenomenon, this uh, ramen noodle. And then these are um, some smallholder farmers in Ecuador that are promoting their food foods for health and nutrition value. 
And then some of you submitted like a whole multidimensional collage, which I thought was interesting. So this one is from um, Indonesia. We see child drinking Coca-Cola. We see parent with fresh fish. We see small kiosk with, um, with different ultra processed food products. So that's nice to also it kind of gives you an idea of how you can make a montage of the food environment where, where it is that you're working. I like these ideas. Next. Um, and somebody put all the different dimensions they, they said that they saw, um, availability, affordability, and convenience. This is kind of just um, a really um, opportunistic um, place that people, I think on the weekend, they, they sell their produce here because uh, the shops are closed. Normally, I don't think they would be allowed to sell there. Next. Oh, sorry. It's okay. I didn't work out. Yeah, sorry. So I put everybody's name. So I just wanted to say thank you so much to everybody who um, gave your contributions. And there were quite a lot of you. There's even a second slide with those of you who um, contributed. So um, that is that is how you photograph the food environment according to different food environment characteristics. Well, that's really interesting, um, uh, Gina. Thanks a lot. There are a few questions um, about it. Um, uh, I can go through some of them. Uh, one uh, asked, uh, have you worked with a photo voice technique to learn about food environments? Um, I wasn't clear on who was taking photos with this technique. Would you maybe reflect on this? Yeah, yeah, I can. So um, this is not, of course, um, as we'll learn uh, later on uh, because there will be a presentation of 10 minutes from Elise on photo voice. This is different and it's really, um, you can call it photo elicitation, I think is what Selena refers to it as, or photo documentation. Um, and again, I mean, the steps are very simple and it's just something that you can add on when you go to do research on the food environment. And it makes, I think, um, the concepts uh, easier to understand and also more alive for people when you are when you are presenting your results in um for example in powerpoint slides it's very nice to have the photos and then again i haven't seen too many people use it this way but i think it would be really fascinating to have uh, urban peri urban rural for example represented according to the different characteristics and and you could use some of those themes that um anna and shauna talked about in their videos such as uh wild cultivated informal formal uh to document you know across a transect or or even different you know now for example there's many different food system typologies you could document through photos how the you know the food environment looks in those different typologies but it's not the same as photo voice mm -hmm. So there's another um, interesting question from anonymous so i, I cannot mention your name sorry <laughs> And is, was it easy to get ethical permission? So it's hinting on if you take photos, uh, you probably need ethical permission um, to do so. Yeah, um, that's a really great question. And um, we discussed that. So you saw a lot of photos were from um, a workshop that we held in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And so our groups specifically asked the vendors if we could take photos of their produce and we also did not take photos of people. Um, but if you're gonna use this technique, I would definitely recommend that you um, investigate um, what the restrictions are for the country that you're, you're in. So I think some countries have more and other countries have less. Like for example, the EU has very uh, high restrictions on that. Yeah, okay, thank you, Gina. Uh, more questions are coming in, so I would like to stimulate you to ask questions in the slido.com uh, question and answer, and also to vote for questions um, you really like and you would like uh, to hear the answer on questions of others. Um, so you can click on the, on the hand um, uh, to vote for a question and then it automatically comes on top um, and has a higher chance to be, uh, to be answered. So thanks, Gina. Um, I would like to go to the next session. And in the next session, um, we will have three presentations 
on different tools um, to assess different aspects of the food environment. And the first presentation will be about uh, the cost of diet and will be done by Anna Herforth. So Anna, um, the floor is yours. And um, I will, uh, um, uh, what is it, uh, help you with, um, with the slides. So if you ne need the next slide, just tell me next slide. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, I think there's a title slide, there we go. Perfect. Um, so thanks for all those photos that you contributed. Those were really wonderful. It's so interesting to see different types of food environments. And um, I put this in the chat box, but uh, I just think, you know, once you're looking for it, you see all of these elements everywhere. You know, every time you're going to buy food, you see availability and affordability and convenience or lack of convenience and promotion and uh, sustainability properties. So um, this was a really great exercise. And thanks, Gina, for, for talking us through all the pictures. Um, we'll, we'll get to hear more about photo voice from Elise in just a moment. But I'm going to explain this um, tool that is specifically focused on the aspect of affordability. So this is the cost of recommended diet tool. Next slide, please. There's a bit of delay on the line. OK. So um, I've been working on developing this tool over the last several years uh, in collaboration uh, with many collaborators at Tufts and the um, food price data collection agencies in Ghana and Tanzania uh, and a lot of partners. So the cost of recommended diet tool is um, it's an indicator to find the lowest cost way to meet dietary recommendations in a given time and place. Um, and it's based on food-based dietary guidelines. So you see some examples, um, the, the Benin Food Guide, the India Food Guide, the US Food Guide are shown here. There are uh, over 90 countries that have developed dietary guidelines. Uh, and then you can also use other guidelines that are not national, such as the Eat Lancet, uh, diet reference reference diet, but basically what you need are um, some sort of guideline that specifies food groups and the servings uh, that would be recommended per day. Um, an important element here is capturing the proportionality of different items in the diet, and this indicator is meant to say, all right, if you were to follow these food-based dietary guidelines, what is the minimum that it would cost you? to actually follow these guidelines. And it's a really policy uh, coherent indicator because these guidelines are national policy where they're developed. They're meant for everyone to be able to consume these diets. So assessing the affordability of them is a key part of whether the food environment is supporting people to meet the guidelines. Next, please. So the first piece of information that you need for this metric is how the foods are grouped. And you can see, um, this is just an example from India showing the different groupings of the different foods, but this is not enough. Next slide. We also need uh, another piece of information, which is the serving sizes and number of servings recommended per day, or sometimes countries give these in terms of calories recommended or grams recommended. Um, this is following again the India example, which shows uh, in the first column grams per portion, and then in the next columns portions per day. So you can multiply easily grams per portion times number of portions, and you arrive at a total grams per day that is recommended for each food group. And then you can find the price of that number of grams of different foods in the food group and find the cheapest ones uh, in order to satisfy these recommendations. Next. So that means that the third piece of information required is food prices. And you need enough food prices to um, be able to satisfy dietary guidelines. So you cannot compute this indicator if you only have prices for maize, wheat, and rice, for example. You need prices on a diversity of foods um, for all of the different food groups. 
in a rule of thumb, the data set that you have should have at least 60 items or so to cover all the food groups. And in general, um, different guidelines group them different ways. But in general, we have, you know, uh, typically seen food groups of starchy staples, uh, protein rich foods like legumes, flesh foods and egg, dairy, uh, sometimes included together with the other protein foods or sometimes on its own, uh, vegetables, fruits, oils and fats. And uh, for this metric, we take a certain number of foods for each of those categories because dietary guidelines recommend diversity in the diet. We don't just take the cheapest food. Uh, for most of them, we take the cheapest two or three. Um, so for example, you know, often five a day fruits and vegetables is recommended. So we have two fruits and three vegetables um, in order to cost what are the two cheapest fruits and two th cheap, three cheapest vegetables. Excuse me, next slide. So you can get the um, price data either from secondary or primary data. So uh, when all of us here on this um, learning lab did a workshop together in Addis Ababa in November, we had the workshop participants visit four different markets and obtain food prices at the stalls where, where people were looking at um, the different properties of the food environment. So in this workshop, um, very quickly, within about an hour of collective work, Participants collected over 185 food price observations for over 100 items, so that was definitely enough to calculate the indicator. Um, if there were multiple observations, uh, like many different lentil prices, we took the average lentil price um, and found, it very importantly, price per kilogram, not price per bundle or price per, per bag. Um, so we had an idea of the actual gram, price per gram and then converted uh, that into price per serving and found you know the price of each serving in the different food groups defined in the guidelines. Next. So when we did all that you know this was really quite quick as a group effort it only took us a couple of hours to come up with this chart which was in these markets we visited in November in Addis Ababa. Um, the, uh, the total cost of the recommended diet was um, about 35 Ethiopian burr, which is approximately 70% of the international poverty line. So kind of barely affordable. Um, the, uh, you can see that the starchy staples are, are a big portion of the diet. So they also uh, have a big portion of the cost, but also vegetables and dairy are high portions. Next. And we could also graph cost per serving. So when we look at it that way, we found that um, fruits, vegetables, and dairy were very high cost per serving, which can explain um, why the poorest people may not choose to use their marginal income on food groups that are relatively expensive, or they may not even have enough income to do so. And so looking at prices this way explains why diets are heavy in starchy staples and low in diversity and can give indications about where the food environment might need to improve to support healthy diets. Next. Um, so there are a couple, if you want to use secondary data instead of collecting your own food price data, um, these slides are, the text came out a little small, but um, I'll just narrate that one of the most important sources is uh, from national statistics organizations, which collect uh, consumer price indexes. So they collect a lot of data on many foods, uh, often at high frequency. And these kind of data, if you can obtain them from the statistical organization, can readily be used for computing this indicator. Um, and they're usually available nationwide. And then secondly, ministries of agriculture or trade sometimes also have their own parallel uh, food price data collection system. And these usually don't have packaged goods, but sometimes they have enough foods to be able to compute these indicators. And the advantage if they do is they often ca uh, capture more rural areas than the um, statistical agency's consumer price index. So two great sources of secondary data that you can look into. Next. Um, and so what you can do, this is just a demonstration, you can come up with, you know, nationwide, what are the, uh, what is the cost of the dietary recommendations and what is the cost across different food groups, as we saw 
in our exercise in Ethiopia. Next. You can also look at variation across space, um, comparing the cost of recommended diets across different regions. This is data for Pakistan showing um, the red areas are where it's more expensive uh, to access the recommended diet. And then we can look at the variation in the different food groups. So this shows dairy, fruits and vegetables were really variable and accounted for the higher costs in certain regions. Next. And this is an, a demonstration of how you can use the indicator to look at variation across time. Um, this is data from India showing that the um, different, the prices across months showed very variability in fruits and vegetables in particular, um, driving seasonality in the cost of obtaining the recommended diet. So those are all some demonstrations of what you can do with this indicator to, to help um, understand where the food environments are supporting healthy diets and where and when they may not be, and maybe pointing out some particular uh, items that are costly that are making it hard for people to afford uh, healthy diets in the market. And yeah, I should point out that these are definitely on the market side, um, that if, you know, if things are really expensive in the markets, uh, people might need to turn to other ways to access food, other food environments like wild and cultivated. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Inga, for advancing the slide. Okay. Thank you, uh, Anna. Really good. Um, some uh, two quick questions on um, on the Slido. Um, one question was um, about how does the cost of recommended diet differ from the cost of the diet tool? Um, uh, do you know the answer on it, Anna? Yeah, that's a great question. They have very similar names. So cost of the diet was developed by Save the Children. It's used by World Food Program. We actually collaborate with them quite a lot. The cost of the diet tool is focused on the cost of nutrients and uh, achieving, um, achieving the recommended amounts of uh, various micronutrients within typical diet patterns. So that actually takes a lot more data. Um, you couldn't really do that quickly in a couple of hours. If you really wanna know about the cost of different nutrients, that's a good tool to use. There's also the cost of nutrient adequacy tool that uh, Will Masters and Yan Bai have really developed at Tufts. Um, these are, are ways to look more in depth um, on, on nutrient adequacy, and sometimes that's really useful and complementary. Yeah, and another question that was asked is, what if there are no national guidelines? Also an excellent question, thank you. Um, so that is the case in most countries in Africa. And uh, as you saw for the Ghana demonstration, Ghana does not have dietary guidelines, so we used uh, uh, a close country, Benin, which has uh, quantitative guidelines. And that's one option. Another option is to use uh, a, a range of guidelines. So you could calculate the cost over different countries' guidelines and take an average. Uh, we've done that as well. And another option is to use a different diet pattern like the Eat Lancet diet or the um, Mediterranean diet or whatever might apply well in your particular setting. Yeah, and the last question I would like to highlight is from Vera. And um, she's asking um, how the effect of seasonality um, is adjusted for in your calculations. Well, we highlight uh, the seasonality. So um, this metric does not always choose the same foods. At every different time and place, different foods are selected because the metric um, the, the method is to choose the lowest cost options in any time or place. So here in this slide we're looking at, um, we actually see that in, uh, in February, in January, uh, in India on average, uh, the cost of fruits and vegetables is pretty low. Uh, and those are the cheapest ones in January. But then when you get to June, the cheapest fruit is much higher priced. So that's how we can look at seasonality. Um, it's always looking at the least cost items. Okay, Anna, thanks very much. There were a few more questions, so please keep on asking questions. Um, also later on, um, we will come back with an answer you can find on the, um, on the internet, on ANH Academy um, uh, later on after this session. 
and so we will make sure that uh, your questions are answered. So I would like to go to the next uh, presenter, um, Elise Pelsma, who will uh, inform us about uh, photo, vo photo voice and the environment. And I have to warn you because um, I imputed uh, this presentation um, into my slide deck and there will be some uh, changes in, in, um, in the format, um, like we had with the last one with Anna's slides. Sometimes the letters are a bit small, so just as a, as a short warning. So go ahead, um, Elise. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Inge. So I will talk a little bit about the voter voice and the food environment in the next 10 minutes. And of course, 10 minutes is not enough to uh, give you uh, the perfect overview of it, but I will do my best. So second slide, Inge. Yeah, so what is photo voice exactly? We already saw some questions in the in the chat box about it. So I, I think a lot of you heard about it and maybe you're already using it. So then you know more about it than me. Um, well, photo voice is a participatory action research method, all about pictures, photos. Uh, mm, um, it has the potential to, 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 to develop insights into experience of people and communities, and it can also help them to, uh, to give a voice to what they feel or what they think, yeah, promoting dialogue in that sense, and uh, therefore contributing to social change. Yeah? So it was uh, the first real paper that's written about it in 1997 by Wang and Boris. They say it has three main goals. First, it enables people to record and reflect their beliefs, strengths, and concerns. Second, it cr creates the dialogue. Yeah? And third, it has the potential to reach policymakers. Yeah, so these are the three main goals that we have. Um, so how do you do it then? Next slide, Inge. So what are the crucial points when you do the photo, photo voice? Well, you take a group of people, you select these people for certain reasons, and, um, and then you have to train them on what to do and how to take photographs, what can be in a photograph, what's ethical. So for example, we were already talking about, do you get ethical approval to take, uh, to show people in the photographs, those kind of things. So if you have an informed consent, this should also all be specified, assigned by, uh, uh, by the participant, but as well as the people that they photograph. Yeah. So then you take photos with a specific topic. You give them a certain topic, a, a certain question. And then uh, there's basically a three stage approach. There's the selecting. So when you have taken photos, you have to choose the photos to the topic. Hey, you can do that together. Then you have to explain the context of these photos. So you put words to the picture uh, yeah and then you codify them so you have to identify the issues the themes from these photos and that's a way of grouping them yeah, and you do all of these three stages with individual sessions one-on-one -on -one, but also by focus group discussions well you do it yourself but also you use the a method a qualitative method to do so to do it a bit more objectively and of course uh, after that there's the write-up and then even more important, there's the feedback back to the people that you did this with. Yeah, so that's basically how you should do it, but it's better to explain this to you uh, with the help of an example. So uh, one of my PhD students, Ursula Tropwasser, she's also here uh, in the group, so we can even put all the difficult questions to her. <laughs> so she did a photo voice study in, in Addis, uh, in Ethiopia, with adolescents. And um, her paper is at the moment under review. Uh, so soon it will be available for you all to look at. Yeah, so she used, next slide Inge. She used the framework that's now familiar to you all, I hope, when you saw the videos, uh, to work um, on the aspects of the food environment of these adolescents. So uh, looking at the individual factor, the social environment, the physical environment, and the macro level environment. Yeah, so all, everything is based on this. And you will see the same colors later uh, in a picture of the, uh, an overview picture of all the pictures of some of the adolescents. So this is what she used to identify teams and to code them. Next slide. Yeah, well then she went to two schools of each 15 adolescents and they were in the age group of 14 to 19 years. And their assignment was as follow. First, what are the challenges in your environment to eat healthy and what are the opportunities in your environment to eat healthy? But then she didn't give any information what is healthy. So this was also open to their interpretation. And they got the, uh, the limitation of taking maximum 
three photos per topic. Because of course this was very difficult. Uh, so they came back with a lot more, but there are ways to come up with less pictures. So this is a photo of the map. Right? So there were two schools. There was one government school and a private school. Um, in the government school, we ended up with 15 students. In the private school, with 11 for certain reasons. And um, yeah, next slide. So this is how, how it was done. So this is an introduction training where you talk about what it is, what they have to do to give the assignments. Next, yeah. And then this is the individual taking pictures of their food environment. Yeah, next. And then you use that to discuss in one-on-one -on -one sessions. Uh, and then you also make decision on which photos do you take per topic. And then when you have done that, you also use the Atlas program or the qualitative program to analyze them, to make teams. And then you verify that with focus group discussions. So then you have all of them, all the group together. And again, you discuss the photos and you talk uh, about these uh, with certain predefined questions. If you want to know more about that, you can look it up in the paper. Yeah, so it's really about what do you see here? What does it make you feel? Where does it come from? To really see the background behind the pictures. And you also write those down. So all of those quotes are very important in the photo voice method. So this is an overview of one school where, where they started with 487 pictures. But then uh, on the one-on-one -on -one interviews, they, came the, they selected 92 photos with the help of Atlas and uh, in the focus group discussion, they discussed the 46 photos and they ended up with seven to eight photos per, uh, in the groups. And in total of every research topic, there were three photos. Next slide. Yeah, so then the analysis of qualitative information. And eh? so there was a code book based on the hypothesis and the framework. And then we analyzed the photographs, we analyzed the interviews, and there was a discussion of the, the transcript of the discussions. This was all documented. Uh, based on all of that, all of the above, the teams were identified, and um, the, she conducted the worth count. Next one. So this is an overview of how it will look for one student. So you see you have a picture, you see quotes that belong to a picture, and you see with the dotted lines how this connect to which part of the framework. Yeah, so it becomes really messy, but luckily there are programs that can help you with it. <laughs> Next slide. Yeah, and then what came out, I will be very short on this. Yeah, um, we grouped it on the individual factors, the social factors, the physical factors, and the macro factors. And in the first one of the individual, we say not rotten, is healthy. So that's what we found out. Then the social factors was more like we have no say, so they felt they did not have a voice. And the physical level, it disgusts me. So this has a lot to do with food safety. And on the macro factor was more like we go for the cheap stuff. We don't have money. Yeah. Next slide, Inge. Yeah, here an example of uh, unhealthy foods. Next. We will go a bit quick here, uh, Inge. Yeah, healthy foods, all examples. On the social level, eh, we have no say, they said. So in the paper, actually, we talk about the quotes that came out of the study. Next slide. Yeah, on the physical level, it was all about the food safety. Yeah, so it was about cleanness. Even a banana that was on the ground was not safe to eat. Yeah, next slide. Then the macro level, if they had a little bit of money, they would go for the cheap stuff, the things that they were able to afford. Yeah. But they also realized that, that it was unhealthy, those things. Next thing. Yeah, yeah so Photo Voice basically came out with, uh, uh, you know, we identified the teams with the healthy and unhealthy uh, part and their perceptions. But then what did it do with the adolescents? So that's also an important part of Photo Voice. It gives people a voice. And so these were the quotes that the adolescents said about uh, how they experienced the whole Photo Voice experience. Next one. 
And it's really nice to see and to hear, and to, you can use this as a discussion tool to bring up things that really matter uh, for them. Yeah, so overall it was really valued uh, highly. Next one. That was basically my, this, yeah, that was my, uh, the end of the presentation. Thank you, Thank you uh, Elise, uh, for this insight in using Photo Voice um, as a research tool. Um, there's one question coming up, and, and this is, have you worked with Photo Voice technique to learn about the food environment? And the person wasn't clear on who was actually taking uh, the pictures. Was it you or were the participants? Maybe you can uh, highlight yeah. that again. Yeah. It were the participants who were taking the pictures. So basically, you, you, you introduce the adolescents in a group to what's the topic, and you give them cameras or with their phone. They go out, and then they get a two-week period or a week to, to take pictures of their food environments that challenge them to eat healthy or is an opportunity to eat healthy. Yeah, so they are do it. So they do it. And then the first question I didn't get, Inga, sorry. Um, no, that's the, the objective. Was it to learn about uh, or that the participants themselves learn about their own environment? It's two way. Basically, we wanted to know the perceptions of the adolescents on the, of the food environment. But then also what came out is that was also what they said in the quotes that I showed in the end is they saw it as an opportunity to think about healthy and unhealthy foods. So I also think that with the photo voice study, you can actually uh, create more awareness on the topic. That's also so, something I would like to research more in the future. Yeah, another question, an interesting question um, that was asked is how does the photos taken um, compare with the actual voiced feelings? Yeah, so the feelings are very important to the pictures and they're also written down and they're also analyzed. And that's all, all what you do in the in-depth interview, the one-on-one -on -one interview and within the focus group discussion. So then the enumerator really talks the adolescent through, so what do you feel here? What do you see here? Where does this come from? Uh, what does it mean? Uh, those kind of questions. But according to a structured way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah, and the last question is, uh, did you give them information about healthy and unhealthy foods afterwards? Yeah, yeah, it was a discussion. Yeah, yeah, this okay. was part of it. Okay, thank you, uh, Elise, uh, for showing the photo voice. And, and thank you for the very interesting questions um, that are asked um, and, and that I could uh, ask uh, Elise. So we go to the next presentation, which is on ProDes and ProColor. Uh, methods and will be given by Selina uh, Ahmed. Uh, so please, Selina, um, take the floor. Thank you, Inga. Um, hello, everybody. And if you can advance the slide, Inga. Excellent. Today, I am going to share some food environment measurements specifically for um, measuring the aspect of quality of the food environment. And um, Different food environment measurements can focus on different dimensions of the food environment and they can also focus on different focal points. For example, some food environment measurements focus on the vendors, um, the location of vendors, all food groups or specific food groups, and the tools or methods that I'll be presenting today focus specifically on fruits and vegetables and the quality of those fruits and vegetables. And the development of these tools is based on observations for my long-term field work in Yunnan province of China, where communities have primarily relied on their natural food environment, including both wild and cultivated foods. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, and then um, in the past seven years, I've also developed these tools. Oh, previous slide. Oops, previous slide. And there's a I've bit also of delay. Developed, hmm, yeah. There's a delay, okay. Yeah. Um, I've also developed these tools um, based on observation of um, built food environments here in Montana in tribal communities, um, as well as interaction with wild foods and cultivated food environments. And so what I've been really fascinated with is the interaction of different food environment types and then thinking about specific assessments that are suitable for capturing those specific food environment types. Next slide.
And so this over here shows the different elements or dimensions of the food environment. And um, on the bottom, we see the amount of methods, uh, tools, and metrics for those different dimensions. And so, for example, we can see that there is a lot of published methods and tools for the dimension or element of availability, and then not as many for other um, important dimensions or elements such as quality. And so I've really uh, seen the need for um, us as a global community to begin to work on additional measurements for the element of, of quality. Next slide. And so the three tools that I'm going to briefly be sharing about today, um, they all start with developing a market basket of foods, of produce. And there's different ways of assembling this market basket. But the tools that I focused on have sort of looked at five um, culturally relevant or prevalent fruits and five um, culturally relevant or prevalent vegetables in a specific community or nation. So for example, in the United States, there is a food environment metric known as NEMS and that lists uh, the five most consumed fruits and the five most consumed vegetables in the United States. Um, however, depending on the community you're working, you can assemble your own um, market basket and this can be done in various ways, including through free listing as well as rating and banking exercises. Next slide, please. And so the first uh, uh, food environment quality tool that I focused on was um, profan or produce phenolic content. And this is really taking that market basket of produce from different locations and then coming back into the lab and measuring the level of um, phenolic content, which is a um, phytochemical compounds that con or set of compounds that contributes to the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties, um, phenolics being a measure of quality. And I found this tool extremely effective um, in looking at variation of fruits and vegetables in different environments as a measure of quality. However, it is not a quick, rapid tool. Um, it is, takes an intense amount of training um, off enumerators. And uh, one thing that's really exciting is more and more there's efforts to sort of measure produce quality and including phenolic content using more field ready methods. And so numerous companies around the world are developing portable spectrophotometers um, for measuring antioxidant quality and other quality parameters in field. And so I think in the coming years, this is something that's really exciting um, to look out for in terms of measuring um, quality. Next slide. Um, and then another aspect of quality is the desirability. And so a lot of times when we ourselves are in um, a vegetable or fruit market, we are you know, picking through the specific produce that we want. And that's an observation that I've had in food environments around the world that people don't just grab any mango, for example, but they're really sort of looking at that, that produce um, based on different sensory characteristics. And just because something may be available doesn't mean that it's actually going to be purchased um, because of those sensory attributes. And so PRODES basically looks at five different observational sensory characteristics um, of fruits and vegetables and then assesses those from the perspective of an enumerator. And this can be both an objective uh, tool as well as a more perceived food environment tool where you can ask consumers to um, rate the desirability of fruits and vegetables. And so when we have the enumerators looking at the fruits and vegetables, um, we're not looking at taste because we're really thinking about what a consumer sees in the food environment, which doesn't actually include taste. And so the choices that you may make are really based on um, the overall desirability, the visual appeal, the the touch and then the aroma. So this here just briefly shows um, how then that data is used um, to have different scores and then you can look at the desirability based on these different sensory attributes um, in different locations and um, 
and really see if specific attributes um, are more preferred or rate higher, and then you can develop uh, interventions based on that. Next slide. Um, and this here then shows um, a total metric that is the accumulation of those different attributes of of the ProDesk tool, and so taking into account overall desirability, visual appeal, um, touch, as well as aroma to come into a total ProDesk score. And then this is basically showing that data of ProDesk scores um, based on a rural to urban continuum, and we, how we see that market basket really varying on total ProDesk scores. And so I found this a really helpful tool in thinking about the sensory aspect of desirability and how that impacts quality. Um, it, it's a very valid tool. We have really great inter-rater reliability and um, it tends to work really well in thinking about the quality aspect. And then the last tool I'm gonna be um, talking about is ProColor, um, Produce Color Diversity. And this tool is based on the concept that the presence um, of different colors of fruits and vegetables is one way to measure diversity as well as di detect quality. Um, the phytochemicals basically having and imparting color to produce that are responsible for different health attributes um, of that produce. And um, this tool is also sort of linked to the concept that dietary diversity is um, linked to the diversity um, of the produce that's available in our food environment. Next slide. For example, um, the blue and purple color of produce is linked to um, the anthocyanin compounds uh, which have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. Next slide. Um, and the pro color basically is an inventory tool where you go into a food environment, whether it's a natural food environment or a built food environment, and you make an inventory of all of the different produce that's available based on these distinct color categories. And then you basically create these different scores for looking at the abundance or relative frequency of those color categories. Um, and the development of this tool is still in process, but it really mimics um, diversity based on ecological metrics. Next tool, next slide. And um, one thing I wanted to sort of conclude with is the importance of linking food environment measurements to measurements of diets. And so I think it's really important when we're thinking about developing food environment assessments that they are aligned to the outcomes that we wanna see in a food environment. So for example, the pro color tool of the food environment um, can also be used to then look at the pro color of diets. And so I think more and more there's a need to align food environment assessments with what we're actually seeing in, in diets and consumer behavior. Next slide. Um, thank you. I'll open up for any questions. Thank you, Selina, for this uh, nice introduction in uh, ProDes and ProColor. Um, there's an interesting question of Jen Lowe, who is asking uh, whether the color diversity is linked more to the color uh, on the outside of the product or on the inside um, of the fruit or vegetable? Excellent. That's a great question. Um, and so the way we do the rating is looking at the edible part of the fruit or vegetable. And so if the edible part is primarily the flesh and the skin is not eaten, then we only put it in one um, color category. But in some cases, um, a produce may actually be in multiple categories if there's multiple colors that are edible. And so we really focus the tool and the classification based on the edible part. Okay. Um, and another question of Sweeta is, is, is um, how is the outcome um, of ProDes or ProColor uh, and the scores, um, are they related to health outcomes? Um, has that be, been studied? Excellent. Or that's a great question. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question, and I think that's really um, where research is needed, is to look at those linkages between the food environment and dietary quality and health linkages. And so we are right now trying to link pro-color 
um, two different health attributes. And so that's a study that's in the works. And I think that's really important for thinking about all different types of food environment metrics. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Selina, um, for your presentation and answers. Um, I would like to get to the next session, so I will stop sharing my slides. And um, this session will be um, uh, doing an exercise, so we need your, your active input um, here as well. And the session will be led by uh, Shona and by Selina. Um, so I would like to give the floor to you both uh, to take us through um, the exercise. Excellent, thank you so much. And I'm gonna briefly share my screen. Um, and so today, uh, this section is really going to focus on an activity and thinking about the need for developing food environment tools that follow specific uh, frameworks. And we're gonna provide an example of applying the framework of our food environment topology for developing a survey tool in thinking about how people's relationships to different types of food environments and how that relationship may be changing, for example, um, in the face of climate change or in the face of COVID-19. And so I started doing some research um, over the past few months, really looking at how the relationship of um, different communities um, in my long-term field sites has been shifting with COVID-19 and um, how that may play out over the long term. And so I started doing interviews um, with a really short set of questions um, that are based around this food environment typology of where people are accessing foods and how that access to these different types of food environments is shifting. Um, and this is really emphasizing the need for developing food environment assessments that not only focus on different dimensions of the food environment, but also focus on different types of food environments and focus on that shifts in relationships to different types of food environments. Um, and so this is just an example of um, some of the food environment photographs that I received from um, some of my collaborators in China of how uh, their food environments have been shifting with COVID-19. And um, these are some photographs, especially in the formal market, um, that many people may have seen in the early stages of the pandemic and during lockdown, where uh, formal food environments um, really um, started having less availability of foods as well as um, higher prices. And in many cases, uh, more and more households were more reliant on their cultivated as well as wild food environments. And so we developed a really brief set of questions based on um, this framework and these observations to look at um, how access to different food environments, such as changes in affordability and availability from these different types of food environments are shifting. And this is some preliminary data from rapid interviews we um, had in uh, different provinces in China. Um, and then um, more recently, I or a few weeks after that, I began to collaborate with different researchers um, to modify that tool so it could be applicable in different contexts um, beyond the provinces I was working with in China. And so I'm going to pass it on to Shana, who can sort of describe the process of taking these questions that were initially developed for smallholder communities in China to um, thinking about the application in different communities um, around the world. So I'm going to pass it on to you, Shana. Thanks, Selena. Um, so much like probably all of you that are on the call, um, after COVID-19 um, broke out, um, we really started to notice changes in our food environments and started to think about the places in which we work and how food environment changes within those settings are likely affecting people's ability to interface with those food environments, whether that be in terms of con the context of uh, decreased access or affordability or other dimensions of the food environment. Um, so basically through a very iterative process, we talked to collaborators from India. Um, I th uh, talked to my um, partners in Senegal and also in Kenya to think about what are the changes that are happening in the food environment? How can we take Selena's tool and sort of um, revamp it a little bit to allow for cross-country uh, cross um, 
comparisons. So that was really the idea of this tool. We also wanted it to be quite rapid. Um, so you'll see as you go through the survey, it's very quick. Um, and the idea is just to get some very sort of crude measures of how people are shifting in terms of the way that they interface with their food environments and then how those different elements of the food environment are also shifting in the context of COVID-19. So um, given our time constraints, I think we'll just get to the exercise. Um, mm -hmm. So Sophia will drop the SurveyMonkey link into the chat box. And basically, um, you can log on to the survey and complete the survey. Um, you don't need to put the demographic information in, which is the first part of the survey. Just in, in the interest of time, I don't think it's necessary. And really the idea is for you to answer those questions from your own perspective of how you have um, seen changes in your food environment over the last few months or so um, in, with, the, with the advent of, of the coronavirus. Um, but also to think about the context in which you work and whether or not these questions would be applicable in those settings and what might need to change. Um, you will see once you log on to the SurveyMonkey site that there is an IRB um, spiel at the beginning. You can just press no, we're not collecting your data and won't be using it for, for study. So you can just click no on the consent question and then skip over the demographics and then fill in the other parts of the survey. Um, you will see some of the questions are related to cultivation and gardening. Um, that may or may not apply to you. I know for myself, I started growing some vegetables um, during this time. So maybe that has also shifted for you as well. Um, but you can feel free to skip over the questions that don't apply. And then um, we'll give you about 10 minutes or so to, to finish the survey. Uh, but what it would be really helpful is if you could use your green button um, in the participant list, so that green circle with a check mark, to indicate that you've completed the survey. And then we can pick up with the discussion in terms of what the process of doing the survey is and how it would be applicable to the settings in which you work. So if there aren't any questions, um, click on the survey and start filling it up. And just a quick note that um, the way we implemented this in the field so far has been through interviews, um, linking to participants that we've already um, have long-term relationships with. So we have not um, used this as a survey before. And so, um, but this is more for the sake of sort of uh, this activity that we've created a survey format. If there are any problems <clears throat> with finding the link, please let us know in the chat um, and then we look for how we can help you. So there's one person who doesn't see the survey. So I hope you try to put to uh, click on the link that is just above your comment. And then the survey should appear automatically. So if you are ready with the survey, um, go back to Zoom and click on the participants list and then you will see different buttons. Um, one of them is green and it's called yes. So please push the yes button if you are ready with the survey. And just to reiterate, uh, for the sake of time, you do not need to fill out section or part one, which is a demographic um, part. You can um, jump on to part two and three 
And also we have some sort of rapid multiple choice yes, no. And then um, if you have time, you can sort of expand um, and provide a bit more detail. Seems we have a winner on, on finalizing the question, which is Talia. And the second is Elise. So if you go to the Zoom session and you click um, on participants, yeah, under the list of participants, you see different buttons. So it's yes, is, is green, no, is red. And then you go slower, go faster. If you click on the yes, the green button, then it will appear behind your name. We have 10 persons who finished the questionnaire, which is good. I don't so know, Shana, when, whether you can follow um, how many have been filled in from your screen. Yeah, I'm following it. Maybe we'll just give people two more minutes and that will mm -hmm. be two. Mm -hmm. And then we can start the discussion.
All right, I think we might just start the discussion. Um, so hopefully you had a chance to um, do this survey um, and found it useful. One thing I just want to point out before we before I open it up um, to hear your perceptions of the survey is just in terms of being context specific. So we understand the idea of this is for it to be possible to compare across different settings. But at the same time, we understand that there's also this tension between being context specific. And so in the context of India, we added some additional questions to this survey and we kind of called those the optional questions. And the survey in which you just completed was the core questions. So there's definitely a possibility and flexibility in terms of which questions to include um, to make sure that it's um, it applicable to the settings in which you're working. Um, so with that, I just, I just thought I would open it up just for a few minutes for anyone's thoughts on the survey, anything that they think um, worked well or didn't or would need to change in the context that they work in. Um, and then we'll we'll share the results. So Selena will pull up the results and just give you a quick sense of um, what, if any, shifts in the food environments that you interface with have happened um, in the context of COVID-19. So in order to contribute to the discussion, you can just um, raise your hand and then we can unmute you. Can you indicate where you can raise your hand? Um, can I? I'm actually, I'm not sure I have the same settings on my end then. Just, just, just to jump in here. So if you open the participant view, you will see where you click yes or no, there's also a raise hand function. And you just click that if you would like to be unmuted to say something. Maybe I'll just, um, until there's a question, I'll just make one other comment in terms of context and kind of um, so kind of uh, adapting questions based on that. So one of the things that we added based on our conversations with colleagues that work in India is the question related to food preparation and cooking fuel. Um, because in those contexts, cooking fuel or the lack of affordability of cooking oil can be a huge deterrent in terms of being able to pre prepare food. And actually, in the context that I work with in um, Kenya, in informal settlements, that's also a huge barrier to um, cooking at home is the cost of cooking fuel. So that's why you see those questions in the survey. Um, so it looks like Selena is pulling up the results. So I'll pass it over to her. Excellent. Yeah, so we're going to be looking at this data together since it is live. So I'm just going to go over a few of the questions um, in the food environment section. Um, so question eight, do you find it easier, harder, or about the same as before the outbreak to get food overall? Um, we see um, about half of the informants or all of your responses um, that it's about the same as before. And then we also have um, about a third of you who have sure that it's harder. Um, and then there's also a few people um, that sure that it's easier. And again, we have basically administered this only as interviews over the phone um, as, and not as, a, um, as an online survey platform. And so, you know, when people then um, respond to this, they will also have um, the opportunity to provide these more rich descriptive responses um, about their access. And it's nice to see that some of you have shown um, or have provided responses to that. And so I'll just read a few of the responses. Um, to get access as we are afraid of getting infected um, in general, most food because of the curfew and social restrictions, um, harder for some um, types of food such as vegetables and beef. Um, so that was um, interesting to see. Um, and then in some cases, I um, also had read, I think in some places people said it's easier um, because they are preparing more, they have more time to prepare food at home. I've seen that somewhere. Um, but anyway, I will jump to the next um, question. Did food prices change since the coronavirus outbreak? Um, and we see the majority of responses have said yes, um, that's over 56%. And then um, also um, a large proportion have not seen um, prices change. 
Um, and so sort of the yes, no is really good for the rapid. We found that's really nice for rapid interviews so we can get a large sample size. And then if informants want to um, provide more detail, um, depending on their time, it's also really nice to have that information. So over here, we're seeing that meat prices have increased, um, mainly imports have increased. Again, that shows sort of the type of food environment that food may be coming from. For example, um, imports are mostly found in formal um, food environments. And then this question um, is really getting at the different types of food environments people are getting food from and how their relationship to those types of food environments may be changing. And so um, here we're seeing that the majority of you are getting your food um, from formal markets, um, almost 100%, so 97%, but a lot of you are also getting your food from informal markets, um, such as street vendors, kiosks, um, and other types, um, such as wet markets. Um, and then a third of you are also getting um, food from cultivated places such as fields, orchards, pastures. Um, and so I thought that's really interesting. And then a small minority are getting food from wild places such as forests and jungles, as well as water resources. Um, the next question, have the places you get food from changed since the coronavirus? And so I think this is really one of the questions that's at the core of this survey or interview tool um, that's aligned to our food environment topology. And here we're seeing that the majority of you, um, that, that the types of food environments where you get food from um, have changed. And, um, and then for about a third of you, um, the types of food environments where you get food from have not changed. And then again, um, a little bit more rich description um, of those responses, and I'll read a few of those. The local farmer's markets opened late, so I could not purchase from there until it opened. This is local organic vegetables. Uh, more online delivery, less supermarkets. And I think that's really interesting. There has sort of been a lot of an innovation in the food environment since the pandemic. Um, so a lot of um, different enterprises are really sort of transforming and filling new market needs and consumer needs. And a lot of that has to do with online delivery. And a lot of the communities I work with in China, there's a lot of new mobile apps and different ways of getting food from what used to be um, the the formal built environment. Um, this respondent said home delivery, also wholesalers who have been forced to sell households, um, which has been nice in a way as the quality has improved. Um, our garden, also a vegetable delivery service, um, and informal places provide more food compared to formal places. Um, so yeah, some really great, um, some really great observations that are, have been shared over here. And then um, this really starts to go into thinking about the relationship of food environments to diets. Um, and then um, another, another question that we um, added in here um, based on our preliminary interviews um, was shifts in um, changes in specific types of medicinal plants um, for protecting against the virus. And so the majority of you have not um, started consuming specific medicinal plants um, or other food items, but some of you have for protecting against um, COVID. So for example, black cumin, um, so this is all garlic, um, really interesting information. Um, in terms of um, how the virus um, has changed income, um, it hasn't changed the majority of your income. Um, in terms of your concern, um, with how it's impacting your diets, we're sort of seeing um, 45 and 55% with a yes and no. Um, and so, yeah, so thanks for sharing, thanks for responding to the survey um, and, um, and providing your responses. And um, it'll be, I'm going to pass it back to Shauna um, to open it up for some additional discussion questions regarding the implementation of the survey. So, one thing that we're going to be doing is um, thinking about the temporal implementation of the survey at different time points. So I'm gonna pass it on to you, Shana. Great, thanks, Lena. Yeah, so one of the things that we also talked with our collaborators about is how often you might wanna do this type of survey um, with the communities that you're working with. And so one of the discussions that we had with our colleagues in India was doing it at different intervals during different seasons. So at the moment, for example, people are just, um, they haven't quite planted. 
yet for their next um, their next cultivation. And so doing the survey before that and then after that might be good in terms of trying to understand how those shifts are happening. Um, one of the other things that we have also thought about is that obviously COVID-19 is a very acute event, um, but there is potential to use these types of questions in other contexts. For example, related to climate change and climate variability or climate shocks. Um, so, I mean, to open it up again, if anyone wants to provide their own feedback uh, in terms of what they think the, the timing of these types of surveys should be and how often they should be implemented, um, it would be great to have an open discussion about that. Um, again, you can raise your hand um, in the participant group. Um, you should be able to raise your hand and then we can unmute you. Um, if you want to contribute to the conversation. Um, I think there are also some, maybe some questions in the chat box. And I'm not sure about Slido. So in Slido, there's a question about, um, um, could you share the results across the different countries? I think it's Amos who asked it. Um, uh, probably he, he hinted on uh, disaggregation per country. Yes, uh, thanks Amos, thanks for your question. Yes, yeah, so um, definitely I think that we would be open to sharing the results. Um, they're still being collected at the moment. So in India, they're, they're doing the surveys at the moment. Uh, I believe in China as well. Um, in Senegal, we haven't quite started collecting data um, based on still waiting for IRB approval, um, which obviously when you're trying to do these rapid assessments in time constraints can also be a bit difficult. Um, but definitely we'll be open to sharing the, the data once we have them. Um, I just wanted, I wanted to um, just share one more survey response um, in sort of thinking about the connection of the food environment to um, diets. And so we're really interested essentially in looking at what's happening in the food environment because we know that may affect diets and nutrition and health outcomes. And so I wanted to just sort of review your responses um, with the question, um, how, has your household changed what you're eating since the coronavirus outbreak? Um, and 41% of you said yes, and about 59% of you said it has not. And I wanted to share some of those comments um, highlighting those changes or not. Um, so I'm just going to read a few of those. Vegetables as quick to cook, less fish as need time, more processing or cleaning. Uh, vegetables and taking herbal teas, um, no more processed imported teas. Yes, but change diet for health reasons, not because of COVID. So I'm going to answer because asking, assuming the change is due to COVID. Um, more vegetables, vegetables, um, more long life products, more fruits and vegetables to ensure immunity is good, more vegetables, less ready meals. I'm able to afford even at higher prices, less salad and less diversity of vegetables. Meals are all prepared for all family members. When one person does not like a type of vegetable, we usually do not eat it. While it would have been eaten at lunchtime or at a restaurant, less fish purchased a few times and it was not fresh. Um, and um, so yeah, thanks again for sharing your responses. And I think one thing that's really powerful about this um, survey is the ability to compare these responses across different communities and different countries. Um, so we can really begin to see patterns of how people are relating to their food environment and then um, how that may be changing with specific shocks. Um, and yeah, I think that is um, sort of wraps up what we have for this activity. But there were still some interesting questions uh, coming through Slido. So one of them is um, how easy was it to administer this questionnaire virtually? And what are some of the challenges that you could um, that you should be aware of if you do a questionnaire like this? And another question was, how did you do the sampling um, for this COVID um, in, impact study? And are you sure that it's representative for different food actors um, in the in the food system? I think. 
Um, yeah, so great questions. Um, when, you know, we started doing the survey, um, you know, thinking about it um, really in February and in March. And so one of the main challenges first was getting IRB approval rapidly because we wanted to begin to document what was happening. And so I would definitely say the initial version of the survey didn't have as much of, as thought. We you know, rapidly developed the questions um, and then we rapidly got IRB approval. Um, and so it, it, based on the sort of rapid response, it, does, it didn't have the same sort of pilot testing of questions and looking at field validity. And so definitely the first round of implementation of our interviews um, was very crude. Um, we were able to get a lot of powerful information, but I would say it did not you know, mimic um, the perfect protocol for survey development. Um, so I think the first main challenge was getting IRB approval and making sure that happened um, at a rapid rate. And then the second sort of challenge was um, having access to participants. And so this is really where like relationships and long-term field research um, has a lot of benefits because, you know, we had established networks and we had phone numbers of um, smallholder farmers in the communities where we have been working who had um, basically given us previous permission to contact them for any further follow-up. And so I think one of the challenge is if you're trying to understand changes in a specific community um, in a remote way um, over interviews, you may not have access to everybody's phone number. Um, in terms of the uh, initial sampling, it was not necessarily representative. We only contacted community members who provided us permission to contact them in the past. Um, and so it's not necessarily a representative sample in that way. And um, our continued sampling, we've tried to refine it, but again, we're only contacting people um, who, whose phone numbers we have and have given us permission to contact them uh, previously. And maybe just to point out one, one more thing in terms of the challenges. So we have people's phone numbers from previous work we've done in these communities, um, but obviously sometimes phone numbers change. And so I think one of the, um, or when people get new SIM cards and that type of thing, so definitely in India, it has been challenging um, to get access to people using the telephone numbers that they provided when we last collected data in those communities, which wasn't very long ago. Um, so that definitely is a challenge and it does mean that it becomes more of a convenient sample than a representative sample. Um, and so that's definitely something to be aware of. The other thing I just wanted to point out very briefly is that obviously this tool can be used in combination with other tools. Um, the, the, the way that we've used it is in communities that we've already collected a lot of dietary data and also agricultural data um, and that type of thing. So we are able to sort of have a good sense of um, what the food environments in those settings look like, what the diets look like in those settings, what food insecurity looks like. Um, and so then this can be used alongside that. But ideally, in an ideal world, you'd be using this alongside different tools to measure different elements of the food environment. I think there's one burning question that's asked several times is, um, can the tool be shared? Yeah, so that, that's uh, a lot of us doesn't, don't have to reinvent the wheel. Absolutely. Um, we would really love for different people to use this tool in different communities and you can, um, you have the survey link. You can also email us um, if you would want further information about our implementation of this tool. And um, Shauna and I are also publishing this um, in the uh, food security special issue on coronavirus that's coming out in August. Um, so that's a resource we can post as well. Um, and so, yeah, so this tool really is developed and we would really like as many people to use it. Um, so everybody's not, as you mentioned, uh, reinventing the wheel. Okay, that's great. So I would like to thank you, Selina and Shona, for this interesting um, exercise and discussing the results and question of the audience. I think um, um, we had this session uh, meant to, to show some of the tools that are used um, to assess food environments and to get a bit of experiment, um, experimenting with one of the tools we just, just developed COVID-19 tool um, on food environments. 
And I would like to open up now um, uh, for general questions. Um, have, so questions related uh, to the background uh, literature, but also to the presentations, the short presentations of the tools, and also to um, the exercise. So I would like to go through um, uh, through Slido, and there are some uh, questions that were um, uh, voted for by quite a lot of people, and one of them is. Um, why in the food environment transition, wild and informal markets are not included in pattern six? Um, so, um, uh, have with, with concerns of su for sustainability or whatsoever. So, maybe Shona, um, uh, you can answer that question? Yeah, sure. Um, so, the pattern six is very conceptual. I don't think that there are really any good examples around the world of what that actually looks like in practice. And so it is possible that those other types of food environments would be encompassed within that pattern. Um, that's just how we sort of conceptualized it as part of this paper. But like I said, we were trying to, to find examples uh, of this in real life um, to include in the paper, and there's really not a good example. And so I think that um, as more and more um, communities and settings transition to more sustainable, um, food systems, then we'll, we'll have a better sense of what types of food environments are the predominant food environments in those contexts. Um, and then just one other thing I wanted to point out in terms of the food environment transition is that it's not that you have to go through all of these patterns um, to get to that last sustainable food system or food environment. Um, so there are various different ways you might transition and it's not necessary to go through each of those patterns. So if you're currently a low-income country, you don't have to go through each step to get there. Um, and so there's various different ways to, to become more sustainable. Yeah, and there was another question related to this, that in some local environments, you can have both wild and cultivated elements. And the question was how to categorize that. Um, so that may be also useful to follow local views. Yeah, so I think that um, there are different tools you can use to capture both types of food environments. So for example, even um, in some of the work that I've done in India with Dr. Supana Ghosh Jareth, who's at the Public Health Foundation of India, we've used things like free listing to um, identify what types of foods are being, um, being accessed from the wild food environment, but then also from the cultivated. Um, so I think there's different methods that you could use to assess those different types of food environments. Um, and I think it's really important, like I mentioned in, in the video um, leading up to this learning lab, is that you need to measure these different types of food environments that people are accessing. Um, because if you're not, then you're probably not going to get a good picture of all the different foods that people can access within their communities. Okay, thanks. Um... So there was another question earlier on when you presented uh, protests, and that was on COVID-19. So maybe it's solved with the survey monkey. But the question was that some consumers turn to online fresh food delivery. And, and do you have a plan to adapt tools like protests to such contexts? Yeah, that's um, a really great question. And um, I ha don't have a plan. Um, but it, it has been um, become really important and um, you know during this time and thinking about sensory aspects and not really being able to uh, choose specific produce um, in, in the context and so I think I think that's a really interesting question and I don't have a plan and I would, I would love to hear any feedback if anybody has ideas of, of how that can be adapted. Then another larger question uh, for all of us, I think, is how do you see measurement of food environments advancing? So let's think three to five years from now. Um, how do you see us thinking about this differently? That's a great question, I think. Um, maybe I can ask um, Anna um, and Gina and Elise to reflect on that. Anna, maybe you can start. Sure, yeah, there's been so much advance in the last five years in terms of just thinking about, you know, food environments started really, that area of research was mainly on formal environments in high income settings. 
where most of the initial research has been done. And so in the last several years, there's been so much um, that we've taken forward to, to apply those same concepts to different settings like rural and agricultural settings. Um, you know, the A&H Academy had a food environment working group about that. Uh, Selena and Sean and I have written about that. And I think this paper that uh, the typology that Shauna presented in the um, pre pre slides to this learning lab was really useful um, in, you know, making it clear that there are these different food environments. It's not just supermarkets and it's not just purchased items. So that's, you know, that's where we are now. But I think uh, it's, there's a lot to be done in terms of how we measure. We've shared a few tools with you today um, that are on different pieces of the food environment. But there is a lot of work to be done on developing tools that are, you know, can assess different food environments in different settings, and then how to use that information to actually improve food environments. I think that's the next, the next step, how we measure it and then what we do with that information. Okay, Gina, maybe you can add on that? Yeah, thanks. No, that's a great question. And um, Anna, of course, is very thorough, so she covered a lot of the points. But so to add on, I think that there's a couple kind of upcoming tools that um, will really be helpful as well. So I'm thinking of specifically the food systems dashboard. It's creating a lot of excitement and raising the profile of food systems thinking in general. And uh, that does have a section of food environment. And, and I think the other five, five years on, we're gonna see um, a lot more understanding of how the food environment is really, as Anna put it, you know, constraining or liberating healthier food choices. Um, so I think that that research is really gonna, you know, the research about consumer choices and consumer behaviors and linked to the informal, formal, wild cultivated uh, food environments, I think there'll be a lot more information that we have about that. And I think in general, food systems are really um, catching attention with a lot of new summits and things. And I, and I guess the last thing is, I feel like we're really on the um, edge of being able to be measure diet quality um, better, more rapidly. And um, then I think that will also spur more like, well, if diet quality isn't what, what it's supposed to be, then how is the food environment what's the interplay with the food environment. So I think there's a few uh, things that are coming on um, that are going to help us understand food environments and the role they play in diet quality better in the next five years. Thanks. Thanks. Elise? Yeah, I also uh, I agree with, uh, with Anna and Gina. So I think a lot will happen about in the methods area. Uh, so hopefully in five years time where it's much easier to, uh, to do the work that we're now doing. Um, I think it's the, the digi digital world is going to help us a lot as well. Uh, I'm personally also very interested in how GPS and GIS things can help us, you know, with um, uh, distance and those kind of things. So that will hopefully uh, go quick. Yeah, I think that was it. Okay. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And Shona? Yeah, I think that um, one of the things that we've been, me, Selena, and Anna have been talking a lot about is kind of developing some sort of toolbox or having some sort of set of tools that are rapid assessments that we can use in uh, different settings to measure different types of food environments with the view to then linking them with diet quality um, and being able to then identify how you might intervene within those different food environments to make it easier for people to eat well. Um, so I, I'm hoping in the next five to 10 years that definitely will be available and it will really facilitate our measurement of the food environment. I, I would like to pose another question. So we know that the private sector is collecting a lot of information, uh, not only on consumers, but also on food environment related components. Do you see in future that we would better link uh, with them and how would you see the use? Maybe Selena, you can start. Uh, to reflect on that? 
Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. And I definitely think that cross sector collaboration is really important for understanding the food environment. Um, the food food environments are so vast and complex. And I think different um, sectors really trying to collect the data is essential. And so in the past, I think five years, there's been a lot more effort um, with sort of policy, um, thinking about the food environment. And then I think in just more recent years, um, you know, uh, enterprises and businesses also collect their own food environment data. And I think that cross-sector collaboration um, really is essential in being able to collect that sort of large amount and scalable data to begin to see these very local patterns, but also these very global patterns. And so, yeah, I think it's really, really important and there, there needs to be more dialogue between different sectors really to achieve that. Yeah, thank you, Selena. Well, in view of time, uh, we have to round up uh, this session. Um, I would like to draw your attention also to um, the um, uh, uh, Food System Resource Center um, that uh, we have um, developed in, um, in A for an age. Um, so I will show you the slides um, and where you can have a lot of information on uh, the food systems where there's also a lot of information on the food environment and um, how to measure food environment and we built upon that um, as well as that we would like to build a community of practice on uh, food environment and I saw already in the comments that um, also London School of Hygiene uh, would like to link uh, th to this community of practice and that would be very uh, laudable. So I would like to thank here um, all the presenters um, also, Celine, um, who you saw on the first slide, who uh, didn't talk uh, to us, uh, but she helped a lot in, in getting the Slido uh, running, and uh, Valerio as well. And I would like to thank also the support we have received from staff from the ANH Academy. It was really marvelous uh, to do this and uh, to have the ANH uh, Academy and Learning Labs uh, running. Uh, so my big uh, compliments uh, for you and also thank you to all the participants uh, with your active participation handing in questions filling in the exercise uh, which really helped um, to have a thorough discussion of these tools so for now um, i wish you a nice uh, day a nice evening uh, afternoon uh, or morning wherever you are and uh, thanks a lot goodbye Just a thank you from my side. Um, thank you all um, for participating. Thank you to Inge, Anna, Gina, Elise, Selina, Shona, and Celine. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of the ANH Academy and join us for other sessions to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.